Hey y'all, this is Mike. And this is Paxton. And welcome to the Mad Liberty Party, where up is down, left is right, the rum is always gone, and the world is full of clowns. If you feel like the world's gone mad, then pull up a chair and we'll throw you a teacup, because we're all mad here. And today we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Todd. Say the last name again. Hagopian. Hagopian. I'm terrible at this. Oh, step in your phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's an emergency contact. That's the only reason it went by. Uh, Anyways, nice to meet you. Welcome to you. the show. Thank, thank you for having... coming. <laughs> um, I'll... Man, I only know you as the really cool libertarian from Twitter. Yeah. Like, I really yeah. like following you on Twitter. You say some great stuff. Hmm. I appreciate that. I mean, I've looked into it now. Hmm? I said that's about the only place where I'm cool, so I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, come on. I, uh, uh, I I looked into you a little bit and, and stuff like that, and I think we all know just a little bit about you. Would you mind kicking this off by telling us who you are? A little sure. bit about the man behind the politics. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Todd Agopian. I, um... I'm a businessman by trade, so I run a company in Oklahoma. Um, I was a pretty hardcore Republican for a long time. I uh, grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is a pretty liberal place. So you, you grow some pretty sharp elbows and kind of, you know, block and punch back every time somebody makes an argument. And for a lot of years, I didn't really give much thought to it. I just, you know, was deep, deep into Republican um, and probably by 2010, I, I really got into libertarianism as Amash started running and Ron Paul was uh, running for president throughout those years. And, and I became a libertarian Republican and, and started Twitter account around that time. And throughout the years, I kind of swung more and more towards libertarian. And by 2016, I flipped over. Um, and that's who you have here today. Um, but for the most part, that account was, uh, it was actually made because um, I wanted people to understand what libertarianism was. So I started libertarian in chief and I started making these funny tweets that was like, as president, I would, and that I would insert something from the, um, the platform and people were really getting into it and they were retweeting it and talking about it. And, um, it got to the point where I actually had to tell people like, no, I'm not running for president. It was just, <laughs> and, um, too excited. But, it, but it really got me thinking like people people like what libertarians have to say. They just don't know that that's libertarianism. And um, so that's what I try and do on Twitter is basically put things in, you know, bite-sized pieces and logical explanations so that people can equate what they're seeing every day to libertarianism, because I don't think we do a great job of that as a party. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think that we can do way better on that. And like, you really do kind of like bring it out there to people to let them see it and, uh, that's not that's not like a small thing. That's really cool. Um, we need that today, in my opinion. Not trying yeah, to blow really hot air on. up your butt or anything. I just yeah, I, I appreciate it. I mean, it's really caught on. It's a lot of fun, and and I think you know it's funny because all the tweets that you have, people tend to really go after and they really like. And it's just so funny how few politicians talk about numbers today. <laughs> so. Those are the ones I like the best, where you can just make actual statistical, you know, analysis, and people are like, "Oh yeah, you know, assault weapons only account for less than two percent of the murders. So why are we spending ninety-eight percent of the time talking about them, and you know, <laughs> no time talking about everything else?" Yep. Oh no. I uh, I think that um, I've seen you mention your family before and stuff. Is this a, a one man fight? Are they in on the Liberty train with you? Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, so I have four boys. Um, my wife is Colombian actually. So she became a U.S. citizen a few years ago uh, after we were married for probably four or five years. And um, she is, because she comes from a different country, she doesn't have the same leanings as us, right? Republican versus Democrat. It's uh, very different there. They have different parties and different things that the parties believe in. 
and so I always make fun of her. She's kind of uh, all over the place. Sometimes she'll be <laughs> super liberal. Sometimes she'll be super conservative, libertarian, communist. I mean, it goes all over the place. Well, um, that must be interesting. It really it makes for some interesting conversations because I never quite know where she's going to fall when I ask her a question. You know what I mean? And I never know what the right answer is when she asks me one. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, she, I think she she always knows where I stand. So it's interesting to watch her kind of get have that argument and, and get that thought process from me uh, and and let's see what argument she has. It's it's kind of fun. Yeah, I've kind of had to. Oh, she's yeah, Stefan. I I, um, I think we lost Stefan's vocals here. Y'all give us one second and we'll be right back. So do you, you know, we're having a lot of holiday uh, time at the moment and everybody's getting together. Do you have any particular bridges that you like to use with the rest of your family to start conversations? Or do you just completely not do the political thing? No, I, um, I think everybody in my family knows that I like talking about politics. They also know I probably won't be the one to bring it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. But they will, if they really want to, they'll come at me. It's usually... Usually folks I agree with, they'll come up to me and we'll have mm. kinds of discussions. And But if we're sitting at a table and people are talking politics, I'm kind of that one that'll sit there quietly and then pop out a statistic, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> just have people start to do You're that, that yeah, guy. I'll, I'll just kind of hang back and, and I'll make, you know, I won't lead the conversation, but I just keep kind of putting liberty in there. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, that's the way to that's do it. It turns into me against somebody else at the very end, but I try not to. You know, I'm so critical that I try Ooh. not to be the one that starts it. I let other people take me there if they want to. So. On that topic, since the holidays are coming up, do you have any advice for other libertarians out there about to face the dinner table? <laughs> I mean, I think I think the best advice I can have is the the best way to win an argument as a libertarian is to use facts, um, be logical, mm. come up with ways to show that libertarian ideals are not as radical, you know, as people think. It's not always, you know, the the two lesbians who own the marijuana farm and have, you know, tactical nukes that are protecting it. That's not always. But that does argument. sound nice. It is. It's, the, the <laughs> argument, but it's not the argument that is going to win at the dinner table. You know, the argument that's going to win at the dinner table is I'm fine restricting Second Amendment rights as long as you're cool with no due process. You know what I mean? Like, Let's talk about which amendments get to, you know, which people get which amendments and, and then it's okay to be part of a different party. But if you actually believe in all the amendments, you know, uh, maybe libertarianism isn't a joke. Maybe you should look into this because here's an example of where Republicans, you know, restrict freedom of speech or due process. And here's an example where Democrats restrict the Second Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. You know, right. those kind of arguments I like to make because then... And I also like to poke both sides in every statement. You know, right, yeah. Shows yeah. that you're not being ultra, you know, partisan. It's just all these are jokes, I like to know? do that, so, too. So let's have a serious conversation about the issue and, and avoid the party, you know. That's, that's like, one of my favorite things to do. Uh, my girlfriend, she's a uh, Democrat, and so is her mother, like, ran for office and all that stuff. And so I remember very early on in our dating life, she was like, oh, man, I, I really hate that Donald Trump guy. And I was like, you know what? I really dislike him, too. I also dislike Obama and Bush. <laughs> and yeah. and it just goes on and on. And then you can have yeah. that conversation on why you dislike all of them for their different reasons. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That common ground is useful. But like showing that you're not biased. I love that. What do you do you ever get accused of both sidism oh, yeah. though? Yeah. It's a, well, and it's not really both sidism. I get accused of, well, you just hate government. And I say, yes. <laughs> that's, yes. that's why I wanted yes. to be so small. That is not <laughs> untrue. I haven't seen a good one yet, so why do we make it so big? <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so I try to I try to get that response because then I can have that discussion. <laughs> so, sure. That's <laughs> Well you you Moving past the family and stuff like that a little bit, you um, you gave us a little bit of an idea of why you became a, a, a in politics and in libertarian politics. But um, do you? How did you yeah. do that? Like, how did you start? That's a big question. Yeah, and it, it's an interesting one because it's not the same story as a lot of people have. A lot of people had that one big moment, you know, and it was like, uh, and 
Um, and most people, you know, have a name attached to that moment, like a Ron Paul or a Justin Amash. And I was not that guy. I, um, I started listening to Justin Amash and I really liked him. And then he um, started talking about, you know, drugs should be legal. And I was like, what? I really like this guy. I agree with him on 80% of the things. Well, why does he think drugs should be legal? But instead of just pushing back, I started to dig into it and understand his arguments, you know, go after it. And um, and then some other things came up and, you know, no foreign aid and this stuff. And and it was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, that makes sense. And, and as I started to go issue by issue, I really took a long time and really dove into every issue. And I changed real slow. I think it was probably, I can't remember, I wrote an article and it got published, but it was probably like 2013 where I flipped on gay marriage. It was probably, you know, 2015 where I flipped hard on drugs. It was probably this year where it was like, okay, you know what? I can no longer believe what I'm saying about capital punishment. You know what I mean? So it's been issue by issue. And, yeah. and I feel like that's the only fair way to do it because of how hardcore Republican I was. Like it wouldn't have been honest if I just moved everything to the platform so i'm pretty happy with the way i did it um and I, and then frankly i don't offer apologies to people who you know dig up a two-year-old tweet you know hmm. yeah i changed my mind because i did a bunch of research um and now i can make a better libertarian argument than most libertarian issue yeah. my research well did you did you just like go get a form and start yeah filling things out and just do it or like did somebody suggest you get active oh, oh, yeah. like actually take um, it to the street or yeah, no it was um i i guess how i got active is right when i switched over i had a decent number of followers at that point and there were a lot of them that didn't like trump and so when i flipped over a lot of them were kind of asking me what i thought and, and i got into austin peterson um and started uh, i wrote a big um a big endorsement for him and did a little bit of fundraising for him um, and really got into the party and just understood that there were a lot of folks out there that run a lot of positions that are really good libertarians and and i started making contact with them and the thing i like about the party is you can reach out to pretty names and they reach out right back so austin Peterson, sharp and that adam is... gokesh and you know and i and i got to talk to these guys and they weren't all my cup of tea i wasn't all their cup of tea you know it, even back in 2016, I still had some evolving to do, you know, but, um, but that got me in where I was like, well, I have access to these people. I can talk to these guys and uh, message back and forth and text and, and um, that kind of got me in. And then I guess as I started doing podcast, talking to me, and it was like, you know what, I need to do something for this party because I haven't been. Um, and that's, that's where the LNC there, you know, announcement came at one point, somebody said, you know, we need we need a businessman in this party. And I went and looked at the financials and I said, yeah, this is a disaster. 2016, we had our best fundraising year ever. Broke, you know, this is the equivalent of somebody who's going pay paycheck, waiting for that next lot. Of uh oh, hold on one second. I'm you're cutting out okay, a little bit. Um, <laughs> could you? Uh, we were just, you were, it only just started. So like, could you go back like two so, sentences maybe? Yeah. I'm no, so no, sorry. Fine. I apologize. So what I was saying is, you know, we went from having 2016, one of the biggest fundraising years ever, um, and the biggest vote getting years ever to 2018 being broke. And it's the equivalent of somebody having, you know, to go paycheck to paycheck and waiting for their next, you know, hundred dollar lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I said, this can't be the way that we're going to build this party to the point where we're going to start electing people. Uh, and that's really what got me that next level of involvement. Um, started talking to people and trying to figure out if I should run and then announced the run, went through the run for a little while, and then pulled back and decided to run for a local office instead. So I'm running for a school board right now. So... That's a big question, yeah. really. Like, why did you yeah. stop? Everyone was so excited. We yeah. were so excited. Yeah, we could see you had a lot of support in that aspect. Yeah, and it's funny because the support was really coming from the Little L Libertarians. It, and I and I love Little L Libertarians. Probably to eventually be one here. You know, I'm trending that way. Um, and, and I think there's all these great people who aren't part of the party yet who would be if they believed that the party was doing the right thing 
and was going in the right direction and headed at the right trajectory. Um, and those were the people that were getting excited. Mm. But in order to get elected, you have to have the delegate support. And the delegates right. are very big L. Okay, they are um, activists, hardcore activists. And if you haven't been spending 20 hours a week, you know, working for your local party, um, then they're not interested. They think you're fake, you're a CIA agent. Right. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, but the real reason is at the end of the day, I had um, a QA and a with New York and they were, they were hammering me and that's fine, fine getting hammered. And, um, but, but the question kept coming up. Why have you not been active for the last three years? You've been a libertarian for three years. Why have you done it? And, and frankly, my son is one of my four sons is special needs, had mm -hmm. a number of issues, uh, serious issues over that time period. And I didn't do anything locally, you know. Twitter was something I could do in the hospital. Twitter was something I could do, you know, in between naps and stuff like that. Um, and I, I just didn't get involved. And I didn't want to bring my son into the campaign. So my standard answer was there were health issues in the family. And I'm not getting into it. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, that wasn't going to fly. I was going to have to campaign or I was going to have to. Um, continue that answer, and either one was either fair, unfair to my son or unfair to the delegate. You know what I mean? Because they they deserve an answer too. Like, why aren't you involved here? You're mm. the star that everyone's listening. It's understandable to me, and it, that makes me very sad. Because like, but I understand yeah. that makes a and lot I, of and sense. I just, uh, That's way better than some of the rumors flying around. <laughs> I know I was worth having rumors, but. Uh, no, but I mean, it was at the end of the day what it was. I, it just wasn't fair to the delegates to continue to give that answer. And I could tell the ones that weren't being jackasses, the ones that were actually, you know, asking the question with passion in their voice, like, I want a reason to vote for you. I just can't get over this hump. Hmm. You know, they deserve that answer. And and I just, I'm not willing to give it. So, so well, that makes sense as to why your tweet was what it was when you were like, it's the right message, the wrong man. Um, that, that, that brings up you, two things you... that I really want to uh, ask. And, and the, the first thing would be, like, how how can you suggest to people, like, how, how can you suggest to Mike and I or people seeing you for the first time, hearing about the Libertarian Party for the first time, uh, how can you, what are some recommendations to get them started in, like, volunteerism and, you know, getting out in the community and starting a political career specific? It's not always easy to get started helping people. It's hard to find them. Well, and, that, and the advice that Larry Sharp gave me was everyone's got their own thing and their own way to help, right? Some people are going to be candidates. Some people are going to be, you know, um, local political party supporters. Some people are going to go out and get petitions and some people are just going to be angry on Twitter. You know what I mean? Everyone's got their own thing. Uh, and for a while I was like, okay, I'll just be angry on Twitter. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but I think, so you have to think about what you're passionate about. If you are passionate about running, then run. There are some great positions. And one of my platforms was to run locally and win locally. A lot of people don't know that in 2019, Libertarians won 32% of the elections that they ran in. Wow. The 32%, yeah. yeah. And the difference between 2019 and the other years is it's an off, right? So almost all elections are local, you know, elections. And the other thing is most of those elections or many of those elections are not partisan. Hmm. And so you don't have to run with the L. But the important thing is not not running with an L. It's not running against a D and an R. Right. Because are so used to voting that way exactly. and we really get our voices out there and our ideas out there in front of people people tend to gravitate towards it they understand it and, and we win elections so i would tell people you know find a local election nonpartisan, low barriers to entry where you don't have to pay 500 bucks right go win an election and that's what i'm trying to do See, I've worked with a lot of campaigns since I was uh, like 16 years old. I've been working with people on local campaigns. Yeah. And one of the saddest things to me was whenever I was calling around, uh, a lot of the times the people I was speaking to, they would just ask, is the candidate a Republican? Then I'll vote for him. Yeah. And that, that was really all they needed. We, we didn't have to have any other kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, how, what... I, 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 uh, you pointed out earlier that there's a lot of people that haven't joined the Libertarian Party because of the state that it's in. 
And I, I was like that for a long time. I actually joined this year, like, a, I think two months ago now, because I do want the party to change. And I think the best yeah. way we can do that is from the inside. Yeah. Uh, that being said, what do you think it is that we can do to get more people in here? And the people that are in here, how do you think we can make those changes? Yeah, I mean, there's some really simple things that party needs to do. Um, no matter who wins chair, this is what we do. So we have millions of people vote for the Libertarian Party in 2016. We have about 15,000 sustaining members. So the first thing we have to do is stop talking about sustaining. Sustaining members, all that means the person's paying $25. Okay. Hmm. Uh oh, you cut okay. out there. Um... The, they're paying $25 per year what? to be a member. So that's what a sustaining member is. It's basically somebody, a paying, a dues paying member. Right. Well, we have hundreds of thousands of members that are free members that we never talk about. So people hear us on TV saying things, 15,000 members. And mm. they're like, who are these guys? You know, um, so we have to do a couple of things. First of all, we need to promote the free membership more because all those LLs would yeah. probably become free members, but they just don't know it's there. And at one point, I didn't. And I even wait, there's a free that. membership? Yeah, there's a free membership. So uh, I didn't wait, know there. Yeah, I don't... How do you get that? Uh, tell yeah, us so about I it. it out I, I said, hey, first thing I'm going to do as chair is make it so that you can be a free member. You know, and then a couple of people messaged back immediately. You can be a free member, dumbass. Don't you know anything about the party? And they sent me this link. And I was uh, like, oh, I'm not great. <laughs> you know, this link is awesome. I've never seen it before. So I put the link. We've got terrible media. <laughs> so I put the link into Twitter. Because, you know, you can see how many times something's been posted. It had been posted four times. So nobody's using this wow. link. And then I said, show me the path to get to this link on the website. Did not exist. It's just a link that they have. Their friend wants to for free. You know what I mean, like wow. nobody uses it, and and it was embarrassing. It's like okay, so first of all, we have to have free members, right? You should be. You can join the Republicans and the Democrats free. There's no reason that a party like ours, who believes in freedom and liberty, should cost money. Become it should cost money. You know, yeah. Second of all, if you join a party in Michigan, you should automatically be registered as national as a national libertarian. You know what I mean? That should just be automatic. Caucus, automatic. Um, right. Because, and I guarantee you, in this world, in this day and age, just a name and a phone number and address of somebody who's interested in the party is worth way more than $25. Yeah, I was about to say, that's gold you know, right there. And we're not about going after names and phone numbers and harassing people, but just know where, you know, uh, uh oh, it cuts you out again. Uh, hold on, y'all. There we go. We yeah, have so, again. <laughs> sorry. So I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to use that information and harass people. But the whole point is, is information is power. When we run these local elections, it would be fantastic to know every libertarian in that district. Mm -hmm. um, and we we can get that data. Like when I'm running now for school board, I was able to get that data. Uh, but that was purely through who voted. Mm -hmm. And a lot of libertarians don't vote, especially in big elections or in elections that don't feature a libertarian. Um, and little L libertarians don't vote, you know, often at all. And and that would be great to be able to know where they are inside your district. Yeah. So that's, that's something that's huge for me is we've got to get people more involved in local elections. The media has blown and the, the general populace has blown the presidential election out of proportion. We need to know, like most of us don't know who our district representatives are. We don't know who's on the school board. Those are things that we need to know. We need to start getting people localized again. Yeah. That's where libertarians really shine, I think. Yeah. Uh, like the libertarians that I know, uh, there's keyboard warriors, sure, but at least they're warriors. Right. Uh, and, you know, they're actively trying to get the libertarian ideas out there. And the other the libertarians are like warriors on the street. Like they're extreme volunteerists. Mm -hmm. they're, right. they're very rarely like softcore libertarians that aren't trying to do things <laughs> but there was a way to bring those two groups together i don't know if we'd be stoppable <laughs> well i mean and and it's so great to to see people when they do run for a local election part of the 
problem with our party is is when we when we find a good libertarian everybody wants them to run for a big position right, right? so mm -hmm. so oh you should run for congress you should run for senate and get two percent of the vote and if you do happen to win you have to quit your job mm -hmm. you know what i mean um and and that's not how you get people that are successful to run for office like right yeah. the second i couldn't run for congress i'm not in a situation in my life where i could right um and, like and but, running for president yeah you know he's, he's like he he may be a great politician but it's probably not the right role you know for him and and i think if you if you were to talk to the the strong businessman the strong lawyer in your community who happens to be a libertarian and say hey do you have eight hours a week to spend on the school board you know yeah i do well you've got a good name why don't you go run uh, and see what you can do in a race where you only need 160 votes to win. So it'll probably only cost you 500 bucks. You so know, that's a whole other thing is even if you yourself don't want to run, I'm sure everybody knows somebody that is capable of running. Exactly. And so, like, for example, the Oklahoma gubernatorial candidate, um, Chris Powell, uh, got a couple percent in the Oklahoma governor's election in 2018 the next year he decided to run for city council in bethany oklahoma he literally went up against two other people in a nonpartisan race got 60 percent of the vote nice wow. with two competitors you know what i mean and he ran the exact same kind of campaign a lot less money put people on the streets to go talk i made 110 phone calls for him you know people people were calling people were knocking on doors and it only took 160 votes to win. I mean, I think he spent, you know, in total, even with donations, I think he spent less than a thousand dollars and got 60% of a local vote. It's the same exact person who got 2% in a governor race that, that costs thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of effort, you know? I think that's definitely where we need to start aiming is the local elections. Cause I think one that, that proves the libertarian uh, message that, yep. you know, if we fix the local elections, we can fix a lot of our problems. Yep. Uh, like it, it never really made sense to me why people want to push like libertarians want to push for a libertarian president. Right. Like, <laughs> it, 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 like local, local autonomy is basically what we're arguing for all the time that we shouldn't have a strong federal government, but you want a libertarian candidate going in there and then doing all these executive actions to cancel other executive actions, basically, right. <laughs> which I get, but it, it's just, just fucking run for the school board. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, we know a couple of things for sure. We're never going to have a libertarian president before we have 20 House seats. Right. We're never going to have 20 House seats before we have one House seat, <laughs> you know, mm. and and we're never going to get our first House seat until we start winning local elections in mass. So I think um, it's good that we... we run for president still, though, like it yeah. gives the message. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's the only good out of it that I'm really saying at the moment. And we've had that discussion. I've had that debate with people, and I and I'm not arguing that we shouldn't run. I'm just arguing from an 80-20 yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. You get 80% of your your effect out of 20% of your causes, right? That's the 80-20 rule. And where we get the biggest bang for our buck, unless we have the perfect presidential candidate, is at the local level. Because if you get people to start voting locally, libertarian, you'll get them to to yeah. get the presidential votes. And and I think that. We waste too much time in these um, in these swing states where we might only get two or three percent of the vote. We got nine and ten percent of the vote out in the Montanas and the Arizonas of the world, New Mexicos of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's areas of the country where we could focus on and actually get fifteen percent of the presidential vote and yeah. lift up all the local offices in that state at the same time, instead of trying to spend in fifty states. Before we start diving in more uh, on the school board aspect of things, I just have one more uh, question for you. Sure. Um, is there any particular topic that is like you're super passionate about, like uh, climate change, <laughs> anything, uh, homelessness, something? Like that? Yeah. Um, the one, the one that's been buzzing for me for the last twelve months or so um, that I am starting to get more and more passionate about is criminal justice reform. Uh, and, and for a couple of reasons. The first reason is is because I think it's a better way to talk about drug decriminalization or legalization. 
yeah. um, so I so I kind of latched onto it because I said, you know what, this is how we have to make this argument. And then as I dug into the issue, I started realizing that the the racism arguments in this issue are real, um, and and like dramatically real, mm-hmm. and and things need to be done differently, and we need to be protecting these constitutional rights of people that are accused. And we need to make sure that people who are murdering people are are getting sent to prison, you know, in, and I'm talking about, you know, police officers. Mm-hmm. And and it's just, it every, as I've started to follow this very deeply and literally scan the news every day, looking for different criminal justice stories, what I found is this is a dramatic issue mm-hmm. that affects people's lives every day. And you never know when it's going to affect yours, right? It could be mine. It could be one of you two. It could be one of my kids. I mean, I've, I've gotten to the point now where I tell my wife, you know, if I am ever in jail, you know, do not answer any questions. If yeah. our kids get arrested, make sure that they don't answer anything. You know, I mean, it's it's scary what is going on in uh, in the criminal justice system. And I yeah. think it needs so much reform and people are so exposed to it and they understand it, that it should be an issue that we're talking about a lot because we're really the only party who believes that it should be reformed in the way we do we're always ahead of the curve on that stuff yeah, yeah. exactly um so you mentioned <laughs> that that's how you like to bring up the arguments i assume you mean specifically like uh you know s- instead of saying let's you know legalize all drugs you're, you're right. saying let's change the uh, uh criminal justice system right like uh, for example in kentucky the other day you know um bad then on his way out pardoned like 400 people and, oh okay you oh, know, nice. like, I didn't hear right, about well, that at all. Nice. It was nice, except like dozens of them were violent oh, criminals, my. and they have and they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are in there for drugs. <laughs> and so he could have he could have pardoned eighty five hundred, you know, nonviolent drug offenders, but instead he pardoned people who are in prison for cutting off heads and murdering their wives and. <sighs> You know, all this stuff and, about it. <laughs> right. You know, so so it's just one of these things where it's like, you know, that's where we need to be focusing and drawing attention to and saying, listen, you know, fine. Pardoning is OK. If, if they got a bad rap and a bad trial, go ahead and pardon them. Um, but couldn't you have pardoned, you know, the 8000 people that are sitting there on a nonviolent drug offense who have family waiting for them to to come back and get a, you know, to get a. Uh, job so that they can go to school and become actual contributing members to society, you know. The libertarian arguments and uh, information that libertarians provide to people about the criminal justice system is probably, uh, in my opinion, one of the strongest arguments we have. We've talked to literal Nazis, literal commun- communists, and we, we've actively changed people's minds, informing them about the criminal justice system and how By much taking it is. that route, um, yeah. Have, have you ever heard of the uh, uh, CIA Contra uh, issue? Um, from the 80s, or is this a new one? The old one. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, where the uh, CIA was buying drugs, selling yeah. drugs. and Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories, but a lot of people don't know don't about know that. Don't know about it. Right. And I'm like, no, this isn't a conspiracy theory. You, I'm pulling and this out of the Congress this up library. Right now. Go do it. Go look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I I made a tweet the other day, and it uh, or I I think I did where it listed like fifteen, you know, basically mass murders, um, every one of which was committed by the U.S. government. <laughs> and it's yeah, like that's and it's like that's so, a quick list. <laughs> so if you yeah, guys want to, if you guys <laughs> want uh, to eliminate you know assault rifles, that'd be great. Let's also eliminate the government because they've killed far more people you know than the assault rifles so i just found out the other day that uh we dropped chemical bombs on rioters <laughs> where was that uh it was in michigan if i recall correctly uh there was a big riot in a coal mine and apparently they used chemical weapons against them oh wonderful <laughs> they called the national garden and then they called uh they asked for chemical weapons to disperse yeah them. this was the coal strike of and uh i think that was on the list yeah it's <laughs> It's pretty incredible. I mean, there, <clears throat> and 
and people don't get it. You know, we have different rules for people with badges than not with badges. And that's one of the best arguments that you can make, you know, is is that the government needs to be held accountable. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights, if you read it, is actually to protect us from the government, hmm. not to protect us from ourselves. Every yeah. amendment is written it's to a... protect us from the government. And, and that's something that we need to focus on when we're talking about criminal justice and make so, sure that people realize that. What is your stance on like police in general? Just give me the rundown of like what you think the police should be doing. Yeah, so I mean, so first of all, I respect anybody that puts their life on the line to protect other people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that most, if not many police, you know, fall into that category. You could even say the same for some troops, you know, regardless of what you think about the military, they're doing it, you know, for the right, many of them are doing it for the right reasons. So I have a deep respect for people who are willing to do that because I'm not one of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, I think that my stance on police is that is that they know that they can get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. They know um, that they are going to be believed and everyone has their own bent on what should and shouldn't be legal. Mm -hmm. And most of the videos that we end up seeing, you know, and that we that make the news are because of somebody's bent, right? This person looks suspicious, therefore I treated them against the Constitution. You know, this is, I heard this, therefore I thought this, therefore I did this, none of which was constitutional, but in my heart of hearts, I felt it and I have a badge, therefore I should be innocent. Um, and I and I think that's the problem. And I think a lot of that goes away if we just stop um, going after crimes that don't have victims. And, and those crimes include, I mean, I got pulled over the other day. Um, mm -hmm. I think know, I remember I your tweet about that. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's like, you know, <clears throat> how many how many hours are spent in this country pulling people over for not having their, you know, license plate updated? Right. How many hours are spent, you know, investigating and or, um, you know, arresting people for drug crimes with no victims? And what if we took an 80-20 approach and all of those hours were invested in one of two ways? They either were invested in actually cracking down on violent crime or police forces were were reduced so that we could only focus on violent crime and return dollars to the taxpayer. See, like those, those two things would be great. <laughs> two things I want to comment on with that is the first thing I've always brought up is why we can't use the police just like we use the fire department. Why can't we have people that are on duty, they stay at the station and they call whenever they're needed? That yep. seems like the most logical thing. I don't need, like, you're supposed to be a public servant. That's what the conservatives right. call you. You're a public servant. Right. Uh, now they've started to rename themselves to law enforcement, which is more appropriate. They're enforcing things all the time. Right. Uh, yeah, I, that, to me, that makes the most logical sense. We call them whenever somebody's breaking into your house. The cop that would have been pulling someone over for a nonviolent crime now is already at the police station. That's going to mean quicker re reaction times for uh violent crimes and think you don't have the 10 to 12 minute waiting times that you do in some areas right um the second thing is it, it, it's scary it's really scary i had to have a conversation uh with my girlfriend the other day about this like it, i i uh we have constitutional carry in oklahoma you know that uh yes great thing and so i carry and i had to explain to my girlfriend like hey you know i have a gun in the, the vehicle if yeah. if I, I whenever the, the officer comes to my car and I inform him of this this weapon here, yep. that instantly makes me a target. It <laughs> it. Mm -hmm. yep. Not not because you know I'm saying anything wrong, but he knows I have a deadly weapon in the car. So if right. I make the wrong move, I'm liable to get shot. We've seen that. There this isn't yep. paranoia. This is stuff that's actually happened. Yep. And I, there there seems to be a very big disconnect. And I don't know. <laughs> To me, it's it's outrageous that the police just don't see that disconnect or they don't care about that disconnect that people are seeing, that there's an actual fear now with people involved with law enforcement. Yeah, that, and, it, and it's crazy because it's, it's always been there, right? I mean, <clears throat> I have never um, almost been arrested or been arrested where I wasn't scared of the police in that moment. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, that is a natural feeling. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean... And so it's always been there, but nowadays it's even, I mean, the, the militarized police forces 
where they come with SWAT teams. And even when you get pulled over, there's three or four cops that show up. And yeah. every one of them's got their hand on the gun when they come up to the car. Do I blame them for that? No, but they have to realize what that does to the situation. Right. It escalates I mean, the situation. If and we if take the badge do... away, if yeah. we take the badge away and have that same situation where just a civilian is walking up to your car with their hand on your gun, right. it, it's. I mean, you guys got to really, really think about that. Right. We have to start looking at police a different way, and that, that that's one of the biggest things about me. And I think that's what libertarians really need to start pushing is that criminal justice reform because it deals with so many things like the drug war, like police violence. Uh, like the prison systems. And I, and I think the way we have to talk about it is, you know, two of our big planks are protecting civil rights and protecting property rights. And we want the police to help us do that, right? Whether it's private or public, we can, we can have that debate. But we want those things protected. So what we don't want is for police to spend time, money, and effort going after things that don't protect those two things and and or put us in danger while they're doing something that doesn't protect one of those two things. I mean, and and I think you can make police forces drastically smaller. I remember when I moved to St. Joe, Michigan, and they had about 3,000 people or something, mm -hmm. and they had like 12 police people, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I remember my wife going, I can't believe this town only has 12 police people. <laughs> and I remember going, I can't believe we have 12 police people. That's like one for every 250 people like how many people get arrested in this town you know like yeah like is it a problem <laughs> yeah like, i'm like we should have like you said three police because there's only going to be one crime at a time in a town that size you know <laughs> so. um yeah uh I, 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 we kind of went into a tirade about police because that's <laughs> really, uh, we both get really now. passionate about that yeah uh, but uh, Mike, we, we actually had a conversation with a, uh, a young person this uh, Well, several afternoon. of them. About, yeah, about uh, schools and things of that nature. <laughs> and kind of kind of as a segue, uh, have you ever heard of, what do they call this, the, the prison yeah, school I, pipeline? I, I asked if people wanted to ask you any questions since you were talking about school board stuff and, and running yeah. for it and everything. And, and we have some students that are you know, like they watch the show and everything. And, and some of one of them brought up, they were asking how, if you believed in the student to prison pipeline, and if so, how do you feel about it? And if you have any advice on what we could do to try and stop it? Have you heard of that term before? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, how I understand that term to mean is that there are certain uh, areas or certain demographics that tend to feed into the prison system as yeah. soon as they turn 18 and and essentially basically fund the prison system um, and, and keep them going. Is that essentially how you're using that term? It, technically, yeah, yes, they're all, they seem to have a focus on like how our education system cool seems to feed into training. that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, they, they have the, the their uh, perspective of it is that schools are almost preparing people to be uh, in a prison system or being uh, enforced by the police essentially where it's very authoritarian within the schools uh, where people are getting uh, very strictly punished like uh, uh, Mike was yeah. talking about how there was a student thrown in a uh, room the other day, a very small room, and they were locked in there for disciplinary reasons <laughs> uh, like an well... iso isolation cell that's actually a mixture of what the other person brought up they were talking about um so we can we can ask about that but that was more about like discipline in schools um what they were talking about was that the lack of um that they feel like you know uh the schools are not actually educating them they're just basically <clears throat> pumping them out into this endless <clears throat> supply of hopelessness that leads people into prison like you said right Right. Yeah. And I think um, basically what I'm looking at from a school board perspective, and it touches on this, is we need to do a few things inside of the schools, um, in my in my opinion. And this is all schools, not just the one I'm running for. I think we have to put an environment in place where we keep the kids safe. OK, from a from an actual safety standpoint, we know what the risks are. 
um, we should have either tools in place or guards in place uh, to keep kids safe, not to discipline them. Uh, the second thing I think we need to do is prepare them for real life. And that's probably touching on what you're talking about here. So for example, yeah. when I was a junior and a senior, I had the equivalent of a grad assistant, you know, job where I helped out a teacher who was teaching science for an hour. I got three credits for going and working at an ice cream store, you know, after school. I think I was in school for two and a half hours a day, my junior and senior year. You know what I mean? And I had so much work experience mm -hmm. by the time I graduated that I quit school and went and was assistant manager in a bank you know, when I was 19, um, and, and I ended up, you know, yeah. And I ended up going back to, back to school and, and doing what I do now. But the point is, is I hire people now that are 26 that have gone straight from high school to college to masters and mm -hmm. their longest job is a summer internship. Right. You know, and, and that, that mm -hmm. is ridiculous to me. And I mean, they're demanding high salary out of, you know, even at the low ends, they want $15 minimum wages. And, and I'm like, you have never worked. You have yeah. never worked. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this yeah. job is going to be 60 hours a week. How the, are you going to handle this? <laughs> the uh, prison system and the education system are like the two things I'm most passionate about. Because I'm only uh, 24. So like it wasn't yeah. that long ago that I graduated. And I right. still remember, like I became a libertarian in high school. So I remember thinking about all these things back then and being so mad about the system. Right. Um, so first of all, I would really like it if you could uh, explain to us what a school, like w uh, what the school board does. Cause I don't think a lot of people know mm -hmm. what it does. But yeah. Why yeah. It's yeah. I would say the majority of it is budget planning. Okay. okay. So uh, like even my little, so for example, the LP chair is in charge of a $2 million budget. That's all the party has. Mm -hmm. Well, this little school board in Bixby, Oklahoma, has over an $80 million budget. Wow. Okay, so I mean, school boards have lots of money because they're getting all this property taxes. They're getting state funding. They're getting federal funding. Wow. And, and, the, and when you have that much money and you have that few students, you'll read the minutes of the school board and it'll be like, they asked for a new bus. Approved. <laughs> they asked for a new, you know, stadium sign approved, and it's just approved, approved, approved. Like they keep approving everything until they need more money, and then they go out and ask for a bill for to raise property taxes. And so, essentially, what the school board does is decides how the money is spent, um, and and sometimes they get into, you know, um, what to do inside the school. But typically, they've hired a superintendent that runs the school and makes recommendations and then they either approve or decline. Um, and, and so in my opinion, it's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily important position that libertarians can take because we're yeah. all about spending dollars appropriately. It doesn't have to be zero, you know right. what I mean? But, but before we ask for 10 million more dollars, how about we make sure that 15 out of the 80 that are spent poorly get spent correctly? You know, uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, well, no, I was just going to say, uh, I, I got three quick points uh, yeah. on that, where uh, Mike and I both consider ourselves anarchists. So uh, we, we, we run with the libertarians because we have a lot that are common, and we think it's the most realistic thing, and we think it's a stepping stone to anarchy eventually. But that's a sure. whole other spill. Um, <laughs> the thing that we love to hear is that libertarians want zero taxes and zero budget and, right. you know, nothing none of that so i think that's very important what you said that we're that libertarians like responsible spending right. uh like i hear people all the time saying libertarians want to like disband the military like no no no, we're no. okay with defense we just don't want overseas uh right. expenditures and stuff right so that, okay. that would be the first thing the second thing uh would be how how is it that you can show your libertarian values within that uh the school board for example yeah yeah so i mean it's great great point so yes we we are okay spending money when we're getting value right yeah. like that's all that's a libertarian value mm -hmm. um so if we and whether we pay you know taxes to the military or whether we're farming out to private military 
you know what I mean? You're going to have to pay for defense in some way, shape, or form. And we and we're fine with that. Now in the school board, think about it this way. Let's say to your point earlier, these seniors, these juniors, they're in class nine hours a day. We're paying nine different teachers, you know, to uh, to teach them throughout the day. We're we're paying bus drivers and all this stuff. But what if they were only in class three hours a day? What if those three hours were hundred person lecture halls or online? because that's what they're going to have to be ready for when they turn 18 and go to college. How many less teachers would you need in the district? Or how much more could you pay for better teachers in your district? You know, that's how you can affect the libertarian agenda. So take the same amount of money or less and give them a better education that better prepares them for what they're about to walk into. You know, I mean, I don't know if you guys went to college or the very first time you walked into a hundred person lecture, was probably the very first time you walked into a hundred person lecture. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was. <laughs> so, and why is that? You know, we have we have hundred kids in the senior classes. Why are they not in a hundred person lecture hall getting ready for what college is gonna be like? Yeah. I had it, one or it, two it, teachers <laughs> prep me for what to kind of expect, but it would have been really nice <laughs> to have the whole school in a, in on it because I was not prepared. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, I mean And, you know, you don't go to school on Fridays in college. Do you know how much money you can save by having half of the school turned off on Fridays? You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of money to be saved from an overhead perspective. You can do things. You can give people, you know, credit for working. um, And and that gives them experience and allows you to have lower overheads and less teachers or the same amount of teachers doing more important things, you know. I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways that libertarians can enact values. And I, and the one thing I would say about the school board is those are property taxes. And, and I get into it with libertarians all the time because everyone hates every kind of tax, right? But, right. but in my opinion, property taxes, and this is terrible, everyone hates this, is the most fair version of taxation available because every single area in this country has a property tax rate and you get to choose what and that value that you're paying goes to something in your local area that you get to vote on and so in my eyes the property taxes are are vital to to give back value to the citizens and the most important more important than city council in most in most areas is the school board on how to spend those property taxes the best way and that's why a lot of people will be like, well, how can a libertarian run for school board? You guys believe in homeschooling and this and that. Right. And I'm like, man, this is this is where the money is. This is where you help your fellow citizens pay less money in taxes and get more value for the money they pay. And if you skimp, then your property value might go down. Or you can decide to pay more and your property value goes up. Or you can pay the same and spend it better and your property value goes up. So that's the biggest thing with libertarians is we... Like for me, my biggest thing that I always try to show people and push people and explain to people is it it's really just about empowering your local communities. The people in California have no fucking idea what the problems of Oklahomans are. Right. Why, why should they be affecting it? If we empower our local elections and we're involved in our local elections, we're going to get people that can actually make the local areas better and uh apply to the local problems yep. um, and I, it, it's really just a matter of educating people like what the local elections are what each of these positions means that's why I think it's important to explain what the school board is for example I don't think a lot of people knew that oh 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 that, that I, I almost forgot my third point from earlier so you mentioned the superintendent because I, I, I was not aware of this so they actually hire a superintendent yeah, so the superintendent is basically the boss of the school system. and That's and not he, an elected thing, though. No, uh-uh. it's a higher okay. thing. And it's usually no somebody who's been an administrator, you know, principal or something like that. And or, and or, you know, smaller superintendent going to a bigger superintendent. But these are the folks, just like the president, who basically propose the budget. And all the school board does is act on that proposal. You know, now, now the school board is on different committees and stuff that will help make recommendations throughout the year to the superintendent. But the superintendent is the one that gets fired, you know, when something in the school goes terrible. And then you go and buy a new superintendent. 
you know, you hire a new guy. And, and then everyone blames the superintendent when shit hits the fan. And it's like, what about the five guys who were sitting there approving everything, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then that's the important part. Like the superintendent can get vetoed by the school board. So hmm. get on the school board and stop them from doing stupid stuff. I did not know that. That's very good information. Yeah. And I, I can't speak to every. No, <laughs> yeah, and I can't speak to every, you know, every area, but the superintendent uh, that my kids have had has been a paid position, paid, hired position. So do you have any particular, like, major, like, I know you're running for the school board and everything, but do you have, like, any uh, projects in particular that you're trying to champion or anything in the future that you think that you uh, want to start pushing? Yeah, I mean, right now I just uh, was asked to be the chair of the Tulsa area LP. Um, oh, okay, so, nice. Yeah, so I'm going to mess around with that. And, and my first order of business there is the Oklahoma uh, convention, state convention is in Tulsa this year. Um, and so that. <clears throat> since the LP chair had left this area, you know, I'm going to try and rally the troops and make sure that Tulsa has a very good presence, given that it's so easy to get to the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and try and get a lot of the local folks here, you know, as delegates and get them excited and um, and, and then in in doing that, help them get ready for 2021, mm -hmm. where we can put a lot of people into these local races. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Tulsa. See, I see people doing that all the time where like they'll uh, Ron Paul is actually a really good example. Um, Ron Paul losing a lot of people just dropped off the face of the earth with the LP. They're like, oh, my yeah. guy didn't win. Now I'm done yeah. with the party. That yeah. drives me insane. Like, yeah, no, it's, really it's now we got to do the next thing. <laughs> exactly. If we lose yeah. 2020, 2021. Like, if you know your lot, if you've lost, mm -hmm. cut your losses and start looking forward. Yeah, and that's exactly what I want to do with this one because it's you know the net the being a delegate for Oklahoma is important, and, yeah. and that's going to be important work. But mm -hmm. more importantly, is I want every one of those people to at least look and see if one of their local elections is open. You know. And if you're not the one to run for it, that's fine. But make mm -hmm. sure that you know it's open and then go and talk to your buddies that are also at the convention and say, who's going to run for the school board seat? You know, who can we put in there that can run and, and go after it? And, and 2021, when no one cares and 160 votes can win a seat, you know, why not go after some of these things? Yeah. Well, if you ever need uh, any help with that, I'm, we're, I'm actually in Oklahoma myself. So yeah. if you ever need assistance with that, you know, feel free to give us a ring and we'll rally yeah. the troops that I know in Oklahoma. Uh, I, I live in Oklahoma City, so it's a okay. little bit away, but yeah. uh, we can still rally the troops, make phone calls and all that stuff for you. Is there yeah. Uh, yeah, any yeah, way yeah, that people. anybody can else that like likes the cut of your jib might be able to give you any help right now or... Yeah, I mean, I, I try not to ask for too many donations in this race just because it's going to be so short and, and I've got I've got enough money I can put into it. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I prefer that people just spend their time and money trying to put people into local elections in their area, okay. uh, frankly. Um, that's more important to me is that is that places outside of just fix me, right? Like you could you could give me a hundred bucks and that'd be great. My money in. But you're never going to get any value out of it because it's Bixby, Oklahoma. I'd rather have you give a hundred dollars to somebody next door that can go in and help your kids or future kids. Yep. You know, um, so I, I, I personally, I guess that's what I would say. You know, if you really feel like giving me money, reach out. But, but otherwise, I'd rather have you spend it locally because that's so. Well, why don't we start a pledge for that, Mike? What Todd <laughs> wants for Christmas is twenty dollars donated to your local election. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. And donate it to somebody who needs less than two hundred to win, because if you think about it, we always yeah we always try and give twenty five dollars to the presidential candidate, and that buys you nothing, right? Eighteen mm -hmm. of that dollars just went to an ad. Yep. Right. So so take twenty five bucks and give it to somebody who needs less than two hundred votes to win their election, and it'll actually do good. That's a good. Uh, point. Did you have any particular questions you wanted to bring up, Mike, or did you just want to do the lightning round? Or? Well, there's the one question we always, I mean, that I think that has become a habit that we ask of people, and it's kind of, I mean, maybe can't be a little bit, but, uh, Todd, what do you think about the boogaloo? Do you think it's something <laughs> that might happen, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, what are your opinions on all of that? 
We can share well, bunkers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all are. It's really funny cool. because I, I, I had started making a couple of tweets about it recently. I just spent the last two days actually in Virginia in a Second Amendment go. sanctuary county. That was fun. So I got to ask some people about that. Um, I mean, here's the deal. I honest to God hope it never happens. Right? Agreed. Um, Agreed. Um, but I, the way things are going, especially in Virginia, to be honest, I mean, this is, it's serious down here. Um, people, people are not happy with what the government's doing and they have had guns for a long time. They've got a lot of them. And, and the government needs to realize that people are not going to get them up. Yeah. Um, and, and they shouldn't because they have a constitutional right to have them. And I, and I think that when government oversteps beyond the civil right that people are accustomed to and deserve, that is when government gets itself into trouble. And I, if it's going to happen, I hope it happens in one random state, you know, rather than us having Across to fight the, the military or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's unfortunate. I think even some of the red flag issues happen just the passion behind some of these um some of these issues and and i hope the government's taking note you know See. If, you, if you come with the SWAT team to the wrong house there is going to be an issue and, it, and yeah. you started it by coming to the SWAT with the SWAT team you know what i mean that so. whole i i know that we the what actually happened with whiskey warrior is kind of confounding and confusing right. but like i thought that one of the best takeaway was the fact that people are willing to help each other they're that passionate about it that they got out there and got arrested for that that was a very dangerous uh, i was absolutely terrified about what was going to happen i'm like oh my god is it going to happen tonight that, but yeah, the that thing like is that, <clears throat> that the, the big takeaway or... is that one people are prepared to keep communications going when things get hairy and two people are willing to get out there and help each other as as fellow citizens and well, i thought that was good away, yeah i watched it all night long and tweeted about it quite a bit <clears throat> and my big takeaway was the very first thing the government did when they realized stuff started getting bad was lie they yeah. started to say that the standoff was over yeah to yep. you know this flat out lie and people on the ground like no that's not true you know then they cut internet so they we cut internet to people all on the ground they cut everything that is the areas. that is the craziest thing though that should be sending off like <laughs> yeah, all I the red alarms on everybody people didn't that they freak are out cutting about internet that. using accounts making false posts well they even yeah, accused the police <clears throat> newspaper of being terrorists for reporting about the events as yeah. they happened yeah yeah and then they got on the <clears throat> newspaper for reporting it and then they started to blame everybody else for making it a big deal <clears throat> when they cleared out the whole you know the whole block for a gunshot that never happened. Yes, lighting. Yes, lighting. They said, and then at the very end, they said, okay, we got him to come out despite all of you people. We negotiated for him to come out. We promised not to charge him. And then they kept him in jail and they charged him with a bunch of well, shit. They, they, let him, they let him get bailed out. And then before he could go beyond the <laughs> podcast he was going to be on, he ended up back in there again and unbondable. Yep. Here's the yeah. thing about it, though, is that to me, uh, it's a super important event because it shows the government that we are watching and that there are people that care and that they can definitely try to take the freedoms away, but it is not going to go peacefully. It is not yeah. going to go silent. There it will not go yeah. silently into that night. And I think it showed a lot of other people <clears throat> who were kind of on the line saying, well, this isn't you know, that big a deal. Now a lot of people are like, well, they handled that pretty shady. You know, that, that whole thing went down pretty shady, and, and we still, to this day, don't know what happened. The only thing we know for sure is that the gunshot that started it all never happened. That's and that the only was... thing we know for sure. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that how the uh, the, uh, the Boston Massacre happened? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, somebody shot at me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lordy. <laughs> yeah, I do hope it doesn't happen, though. <clears throat> I, I just, uh, if it does happen, are you prepared? I hope you are. <laughs> I have several weapons. <laughs> so, yeah. I was talking to Mike 
earlier today that I don't want to get a crossbow. Because I don't think they're going to be regulating those anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, I'm a shotgun guy, so I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I think. Okay. Well, we, we have, like, a lightning round where we hit you with a bunch of simple questions real quick. Totally yeah. simple. Well, sure. they are typically pretty simple. Um, cause like we, we'd like to pick your brain in fast style about you and, uh, sure. they're usually pretty easy ones to answer. Like, uh, what's your favorite color? Blue. Blue. Uh, yep. what's your favorite video game? Uh, Madden. Madden. What is that? I don't know that game. It's a, it's a football game. <laughs> oh, that's why I don't know that game. Okay, I don't do the sports <laughs> stuff, so I'm I'm dumb to that. Um, what's your favorite book? Uh, and Rand's and Rand's yes. anthem. Yes. If you've ever read nice. anthem, it's a little you know it's not the one people really read off, but take a look at that. It's like thirty pages, best thirty pages you'll ever read. You're such a saint. Like anybody that says <laughs> Anne Rand is like yes. <laughs> Um, let's see. What's your favorite show right now? Uh, we are watching... Let me think what we're watching right now. Um, shit. The, uh, Evil. What's that one about? Yeah, I've never it heard is, of it. Yeah, let me think what this thing is. It is, um... It's kind of a comedy, but, but it's pretty serious. It's like, um, this lady and a priest and somebody else are um they are working for the church and they investigate you know church issues like um oh that and, sounds fun uh, yeah and then uh and then there's the devil or somebody i don't know who he is you know that is um that is doing very bad things and they kind of have run-ins it's, it's a really i can't even explain it but it's kind of like a religious thriller i might have to uh, check that out religious. Yeah, I'm not religious, but it's uh, it's a good one. My wife got me onto it, and we're watching that a lot. When have you ever played D&D? Yeah, that's the good one. What was that? Have you ever played D&D? No. <laughs> oh, man. I'm trying, when... to, I'm trying to get a... a, a <laughs> have you, so we can uh... all just scream about taxation. Let's see, what's your favorite sweet and or snack? Uh, I do not eat sweets or snacks. Typically. Oh, uh, yeah, but I'm like real health conscious. Uh, I'm about 70 pounds overweight. I don't drink or eat sweets, I just eat a lot of food. Okay, <laughs> I would prefer to invest my calories. And in... oh, that fair. sounds yeah. good when you're really stressed out. How do you get unstressed? Yes, yeah, so I, I do mindfulness. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Not I do, I am. Yeah, so, you know, um, so basically meditation and mindfulness, but mindfulness is something I've gotten into recently. Bunch of hippies. Me too. He <laughs> calls me a hippie, but it, it's helpful if you ask me. Um, let's is. see. What's your favorite, like, recreational activity? Uh, yeah, I love playing poker. I don't get to do it very often. I don't know if that's recreational, if you're talking about sports. I think that's <laughs> recreational. It's just... Yeah. You're, poker. You're not poker. Uh, yeah, I don't get to do it very often, but it's a lot. You're a politician, so it's important. Dog or cat? <laughs> uh, I have two of each. Oh. I'm, yeah, I'm definitely a dog person. You bribed me to get the two cats. I said, you can have, if I can run for LP chair, and she oh. said, okay. <laughs> you almost forgot. What? Do you have... A, uh, a a cute story about like how you uh, got into your relationship. Oh yeah, that's the yeah. good one. Yeah, not a cute story, but we were so she was a friend of friend who was Colombian but living in Michigan, and so I met her in Chicago, and then she went back home, and I was too poor to travel, so we kind of did this long distance thing for a long time, hmm. and I actually broke up with her. Uh, because I never thought that I was going to be able to afford to, you know, visit her and, and do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, after I got my MBA and, and had money, had the right job and whatnot, we kind of started talking again. And it took me a long time to kind of get her over the me breaking up with her. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, but we had to get back together and it was pretty fast. It was probably 
six months of dating and then probably uh, a year of engagement, maybe married. So and four kids later. Well, hey, wow. that's an enduring that's, that's an story, story, though, because like yeah. you hear about people just at the that that we've got the distance and then it, it ends there. That it doesn't go any yeah. further. So like that's actually kind of like a cool story, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we always joke around about it because it, it took me a lot of doing to get her back, <laughs> to get her back after I let her go. So. Uh, any final questions, Mike? I think that's about it for me, man. Do you have any plugs that you would like to tell us about, Todd? Yeah, anything no, I'm cool? Good. You know where to find oh. me, just uh, at Twitter, or at Todd Agopian on Twitter. I did forget to ask one question that we were going to ask yep. at the end there. We were going to ask you if you are, if you have any, like, preferred activism or causes or anything out there that you, like, support or anything like that. And if you wanted to, like, pick your favorite one and tell us about it real quick before we... Because usually we pick <laughs> another YouTuber at our shows and talk about them or something but i thought that maybe like here we could talk about like maybe something that you support that you think other people should look into yeah i mean the only thing that i would say probably is um my very first dog you know we we got from a breeder <clears throat> and then after that i learned a lot about breeding versus rescue uh and, and rescue animals and stuff that mm -hmm. we've gotten fairly passionate about and our last four animals have been rescued just say you know before you buy from you know do your research and understand what rescue is all about and how you could be saving lives and <clears throat> and and potentially stopping kind of harm practices in oh, some yeah. of the other areas so um, it's not something i give it to anytime anybody asks me about animals and i make sure that that story gets out there and, and it's the only one that we you know we go to we go to kill shelters now so we've taken it even the next level, you know, and we go to the shelters where yeah. you're for saving somebody, and um, and that's what we've tried to focus on. So, oh, that's a good one. Thank you, man. Yeah. And hey, thank you yeah. for like re re reaching back and coming on our show and stuff like that. I mean, we're not a giant, so I was like very excited when you were like, "Yeah, I'll come talk <laughs> to you." I was like, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those things that, that you mentioned earlier about libertarians being willing to reach out and talk to each other and I'm I was like yes I noticed that it's very exciting <laughs> <laughs> well I appreciate you guys interacting on so keep it up let's keep talking and I'll yeah. come back on whenever you guys want so. definitely I would love to keep in contact and you keep on keeping on and fighting the good fight man very good well thank you guys very much yeah, no problem. I guess this mad liberty party is a journey.